The downfall of an American hero, the defeat of a president, the sick world of Las Vegas, and the violent anarchy of the Hells Angels. Part of a chronicle of the death of the American dream, created by journalist Hunter Thompson. Tonight's omnibus makes a valiant attempt to follow Thompson and English artist Ralph Steadman on a wild trip across America. Day one. The English artist Ralph Steadman sets off with a BBC film crew for Aspen, Colorado to meet an old friend. None of us knows what's going to happen. Throughout the flight, this is our good old summertime flight where we're offering nickel beer and lemonade. Your crew for today is Captain Barr Bentler and First Officer Klaffenstein. Hope you have a pleasant flight. Thank you. Well, it must be four years now, nearly five. I don't know what the man has done since then. He may have terrible brain damage, you know. When I meet him, he may not even recognize me. Imagine that. He, he sometimes goes for people. He has these mace guns and um, CO2 uh, fire extinguishers, which he usually just aims at people. But you see, he has this amazing uh, power in Aspen. The police just go with him because they're so scared of him. He's a little older. And perhaps, mm, how can I say, is a real word that would express. You see, his weirdness is probably uh, toned down a little to the point where he might think before he does something. He might, we might just be safe on this journey. I don't know. On behalf of Rocky Mountain Airways and your flight crew, we'd like to thank you for flying with us today. Have a pleasant stay in Aspen or wherever your final destination might be. Oh, God, what is he? Hunter, it's me! What? Never a plane taking off? No, where? Two, two wings away. No, never. Yeah. There's never one around here. What's it? Can't be the one. Yeah. Come on. Come on, hey, wait a minute, hey! Dr. Hunter Thompson and Ralph Steadman have worked together on articles in Rolling Stone magazine. Hunter's adventures as a journalist have elevated him to a kind of cult hero. His articles are obsessed with a vision of America gone rotten. The phrase fear and loathing appears in nearly all his titles, an indication of the violence and paranoia that marks his work and has become associated with his personality. His reputation gives him access to just about every major figure in politics, show business and sport. Hunter's influence as a political commentator is recognised by all leading politicians. And his support for President Carter's election platform is credited with swaying young American voters in Carter's favour. Yet this man is an ex-Hell's Angel whose work is marked by a celebration of violence, drug-taking and personal risk. In 1970, he stood for political office as sheriff of his hometown of Aspen, Colorado. He called himself Freak Power Candidate and was only narrowly defeated. I think I, uh, unfortunately, proved what I set out to prove. And I, I think the original reason was to prove it to myself. That the American dream really is f I think that. Yeah, you're right. Well, I didn't believe it until now, and I'm not sure that this is really the proof of it. It's, it's very hard to, you know, to have a bald-headed lunatic. I'll do that for the cameras. Uh, All right. I've already made up my mind, as a matter of fact. This is my last trip in in politics, or this kind of politics. I assure you, I'll be in another kind of politics. I'm not sure which way I'll go, but it'll be one or the other. It won't be down this middle anymore. If Hunter's political career had come to an abrupt end, he was already famous for the wildly inventive style of his writing. It began in 1970 when he was sent as a sports correspondent to cover the Kentucky Derby. He became much more interested in observing the characters and the events surrounding the race and the process of getting the story than in the story itself. Unlike most of the others in the press box, we didn't give a hoot in hell what was happening on the track. 
we had come to watch the real beasts perform. I pointed to the huge grassy meadow enclosed by the track. That whole thing, I said, will be jammed with people, 50,000 or so, and most of them staggering drunk. It's a fantastic scene. Thousands of people fainting, crying, copulating, trampling each other, and fighting with broken whiskey bottles. This highly personal form of journalism became known as Gonzo, and his illustrator, Ralph Steadman, had to respond to it. I think what he saw in this our connection was somebody that somehow saw the things in pictures as he saw them in words, you know. And that seemed to me to be part of the whole chemistry of it, that our chemistry there made Gonzo possible. I'm Edward. He has a bird called Edward, he's such a marvellous character, which I think Hunter tormented it, but I think there was a kind of a, a two-way uh, affection, there's something going on, you know. Edward, talk to me. No. Hunter would use it, I think, to to bounce off, you know, we'd use it as a kind of a victim, you know, something to to bring into the story and the way he was, how he was feeling about it, who was the bird. I suppose that at some point I, in a way, became the bird, you know. I was... So, now we're going to talk a bit. Speak to me, yes. I feel like Edward sometimes in a situation. I feel absolutely uh, uh, taken apart, as though he's had a he's had a whole session of talking to me, you know, hold, you know, holding holding me like a bird. I'm trying to bite my way out of it, get the hell out of this thing. Speak up, Edward. Speak. Uh, speak up. Talk to me. Are you trying to instigate a problem or something? No, I just wonder. You are, I, I'd ask. Uh, obviously, I have a problem, right? I mean, why are you here? Okay, why don't you do us all a favor? Instead of antagonizing leave? the situation, why don't you just leave? Okay, shucks. Okay. You on the streets, right? From the book Hell's Angels, the flames lit up the street just about the time the National Guard arrived on the scene with fixed bayonets and rifle butts swinging. The mob scattered, many of them blinded by tear gas bombs. The police were pelted with firecrackers, rocks and beer cans, but they were wearing helmets and their six weeks of training served them well. What's that? The menace is loose again. The Hell's Angels, the hundred carat headline running fast and loud on the freeway, jamming crazy through traffic and 90 miles an hour down the center stripe, missing by inches, like Genghis Khan on an iron horse, with Sodom 500 miles to the south in the vast mad bowl of Los Angeles, home turf of the Satan's slaves with their taste for the flesh of young dogs and tender young blondes with lobotomy eyes. Obviously, one of the things I have to think of I have to appreciate in that America. If I, I didn't, I'd be as stupid or insane as that uh, for good or ill, I can function here. And uh, I don't think that there are many societies or social political systems where I could function the way I am now. And perhaps a lot of people would think it's much better. You know, that's the best argument for destroying the system, that it gets rid of people like me. Editor's note. Due to circumstances beyond our control, the following section was lashed together at the last moment from a six-pound bundle of documents, notebooks, and recordings. Dr. Thompson's plan, he says, is to create an entirely new form of journalism. In the meantime, we have suspended his monthly retainer and canceled his credit card. During one four-day period in Washington, he destroyed two cars, cracked a wall in the Hilton, purchased two French horns at $1,100 each, and ran through a plate glass door in a Turkish restaurant. Most people are surprised that I walk on two legs. And uh, the idea that I would have a wife or a child, or I think I said this, even a mother, that seems to surprise me. I think people think I'm uh, very much Maybe a violent version of that comic strip. I am living a normal life. You know, I own a, you know, a ranch in Colorado, and I have a wife and a child, and uh, peacocks and dobermans. Day two, Al Farm Aspen. No sign of Hunter all morning. When he finally appears, we approach him with caution, and he clearly has his doubts about us. I don't see how you could possibly make a true film. 
Just because by bringing all this machinery in, you, uh, you create a situation that's unnatural anyway. I mean, it's, not, it's not you, it's, it's uh, I think, one of the problems with film. What if it was one of I don't understand film that well. That's one of the reasons I, I want to learn about film. I think the technology is not up to the, uh, the level where we have to get in order to portray reality. I mean, the technology warps reality, the, you know, the, the portrayal. Film interests me. I'd like to, I'd like to play with it. Nice. Different, eh? Go ahead. Talk it. Beautiful trigger. Beautiful. I mean, you should at least know what the hell handguns are all about. It's frightening, that. Uh, I'm going to try to get the target, too. Let's see. Uh, aim at the, uh, at the dirt over there. Hang on. I'm, I know you got to get going. All right. Oh! That'll kill a bear at 200 yards. I won't believe it. Yeah. Hunter's violent public image is largely okay. the result of a fictional character he himself created. Hunter called him Raoul Duke a sort of drug-crazed journalist sent to Las Vegas in search of the American dream. The book Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, A Savage Journey to the Heart of the American Dream, was Hunter's vision of an America gone rotten, as seen through the eyes of Raoul Duke. I think it's about time to get into the ether and the cocaine. My attorney was now fumbling with a salt shaker containing the cocaine, opening it, spilling it, then screaming and grabbing at the air as our fine white dust blew up and out across the desert highway. <laughs> oh, Jesus, he moaned. Did you see what God just did to us? God didn't do that, I shouted. You did it. You're a narcotics agent. You better be careful, he said. And suddenly he was waving a black point three five seven magnum at me, one of those snub nosed coat pythons with a bevel cylinder. Plenty of vultures out here, he said. They'll pick your bones clean before morning. I've been using Duke for uh, over ten years, maybe more. I began to use him originally as uh, he was always. Oh, he he was a, a vehicle for. Uh, Quotations that nobody else would say. That was me really talking. Those were, those were my quotes. The only way to prepare for a trip like this was to dress up like human peacocks, get crazy, screech off across the desert and cover the story. But what was the story? Nobody had bothered to say. So we would have to drum it up on our own. Free enterprise, the American dream. Do it now. Pure gonzo journalism. I think I've taken that form as far as I can take it. I, I, I found that I re I'm starting to repeat myself anyway. And it's not, not as much fun anymore. It's hard for me to work on a story now. I go to that. I've become part of the story. The first time I went to a press conference with Jimmy Carter, I had to sign more autographs than Carter signed. And the Secret Service had no idea who I was. They thought I was an astronaut. And, you know, it's, I used to be able to stand in the back, you know, and observe stories and absorb them. I can't do that. Now, the minute I. I appear at a story, then I become part of it. 